Well, I guess I could start earlier. Welcome in those raiders. Hello, raiders. Sorry. No, my... Had to add an extra couple minutes. Welcome in, everyone from Nomadic and uh, Eris. How is Norm Gnome Brew this morning? I am your friendly neighborhood Prax. Welcome to the channel. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And uh, today we're going to be chatting about things. And I have to turn the captions on. <laughs> so give me a sec. But how are we doing? How's everybody playing? How's everybody been? Okay. Okay. Good. Click the button. Um, how we doing? How's life going for everybody? We are... Okay. Mine's a... All right. Go back. There we go. All right. So, um... How we doing? How's life going for you? Um, we are... Doing okay. Naps. Naps are the word of the day. I mean... I appreciate that. Ooh, that's a little loud. Bring it down a little bit. Um, welcome in, welcome in. Yes, there was a really great topic at PAX about this. We were just trying, uh, Faye, I did, I did see um, Kay, you're correct, Kay Dampier did, a, they were part of a um, great panel about this at PAX U, but we were chatting about this yesterday in cypher stream um welcome in everybody and i hope you had a really good morning over with gnome and eris and chill and had some good good gnome, gnome brew this morning you know how how are we doing how's life going um we uh and it you know if you need to raid and run totally understand have yourself a wonderful day have yourself a great day I, again, am here to chat and chill and talk and things. This whole stream came up as an idea because we were chatting in um, Cypher of Tear, Tanya's channel, or I was through, you know, stuff during her stream yesterday. And one of the things that came up was the way in which people approach or talk to people about doing charity streams or the ways in which they don't do that very well. Um, and so we were chatting and it's like, yeah, this is, this is why I do certain things when I um, get this going. And Tanya's response is, good, you should talk about this. You should tell people about this. I'm like, okay, fine. I know what I'm doing tomorrow. And that's what this is. This is just a chill chat we will talk, we will come, we will, naps are important, also charity streams are hard. This is true. And sometimes after 12 hours of charity stream DMing and producing, I needed a lot of naps. There's no nap shame here. Naps are important. <laughs> Welcome in Macadis. Oh, I'm glad you found Gnome. Uh, and that will be a good thing to get started. Um, uh, but this whole thing, like I said, this whole thing got started because of chats. And for those of you who don't know, I ran on New Year's Day a 12-hour D&D charity stream streamed around, uh, themed around Castlevania. 17 players, four sessions, um, ended up being 16 players because we had a couple people who weren't able to join us. Um, but planned for 17 players. Um, 12 hours, four sessions, three hours each, classic Castlevania games, donations for wall chicken, all of these things. All of this was to benefit Fisher House Foundation, which is a charity that provides housing care and support for veterans and their families while those veterans undergo treatment at various VA hospitals around the country. Um, you can find out more about them by using exclamation point ch charity. Is that still up? Nope. Yes, it is. Haha. -ha. They're really good. Um, we did a lot of really good things. We were very, very um, fortunate. We met our goal. Thank you for that follow. Welcome in. Uh, we were very fortunate for that we met our goal. We met our and beat our goal. We ended our goal was a thousand dollars. We ended up with a thousand eighty-five, 
which is great and fabulous and really good things for a really great charity. But there's a lot of work that goes into if you want to be the GM. Oh, always good. Always good. Um, but there's a lot of work that goes into if you want to be the GM or the producer or like me, both for a major charity stream like that, right? Like, yeah, the uh, 13 and a half hours of time that I was on stream, and that counts breaks, transitions from team to team, um, or uh, wind down and wind up, you know, is the very last part. <laughs> Although it is considered the longest part, it is the very last thing that uh, needs to be taken into account <laughs> um, for any of these kind of major streams, major events, major things that you're doing. Uh, part of that really comes down to knowing a lot of what people see at the end product and knowing that a lot of people don't see everything that goes into it, right? Like there's so much that goes into it. And there are a lot of really great people out in our space um, in various ways that do a lot of these things or want to do a lot of these things. So if you can find the VOD from that panel from PAXU, they did a really great job talking about that. I want to talk about a couple other little things that came up that I think are equally important, particularly after conversations that I've had with people who ended up playing for me. So why don't we start at the very beginning, which I am told is a very fine place to start. Um, and we start with... <laughs> go, go right ahead and enjoy some D&D. &D. Um, and if you came in with Gnome and you decided to hang out and you like the vibes, you want to listen to what I'm saying, go ahead and just click the little circle underneath so you register it as a viewer as well. Come in. We appreciate it. Hey, Gnome, how you doing? Hope your day was good. Hope Gnome Brew had a lot of really good chill and gets your morning going. Also, uh, can I just say that I really love the art that you've been posting all over the place? Uh, fab, absolutely fab. Um, but we should start at the beginning when we talk about charity streams. And uh, I'm going to use a lot of terms and I'm gonna sound very, very old fashioned. Hold on a sec, it sounds like an alarm is going off and uh, that might be a bad thing, so let me double check on that. BRB! Enjoy the chill vibes for a second. Okay, was not my alarm, it was down the street. Don't have to worry. Um, but, 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 we are starting at the very beginning. And I'm going to talk about these things in very specific terms. And a couple of the things that I'm gonna talk about might seem very old fashioned, but really there's a lot of reason why those terms and concepts persist and are actually beneficial. So first of all, I titled this, you know, throwing the perfect tabletop um, charity stream for a reason. Uh, because one of the things that I have found that is most useful for anyone who wants to do one of these kind of events or wants to do any kind of tabletop game in general is to think of it like you are throwing a dinner party. Yes. I am making that illusion and metaphor, and yes, it is perfect. Let me explain. You are 
the host, is a gender neutral term in this case, um, of this event. Whether you are just the GM, well, whoever you are in whatever capacity you're doing this, whether you're just the producer and you're going to have a bunch of GMs do this, whether you're the producer and GM, whether you are the charity that wants to per begin this, you are the host. Now, some of those people will split off into different groups and will have slightly less responsibility. For example, if this is a charity and you're hiring out for someone else to do the production and then uh, everything, then they're going to be your, um, for lack of a better term, uh, hostess in this, uh, Chatelaine in this event. But you, if you are the producer, if you're the GM producer, you are the host. You are the person inviting people to something, right? Like, that's the thing. Remember when you were a kid and you got the, we got all went to like your friend's birthday parties and there were these like actual invitations and they were really pretty and, or they were, you know, whatever comic book character of the event or whatever was happening. But they were like, they gave you information and they were an invitation, right? You were inviting somebody to something. Um, that's the same kind of idea thought process you want to go into when you're going to talk about this. And part of this came up because oops, I do not want to put my arm in that, um, in that open pen. That would be bad. Um, part of this came up because Tanya was talking, Cypher of Tear was talking yesterday in her stream about people who, instead of just speaking something into the universe, speak something into the universe and then tag a particular creator but they don't have a follow-up like rather than just saying oh i it's someday i dream i'll ever play at a table with you know fill in the blank personality here they go on and tag that particular personality on twitter so that person can see it and they're like okay so what are you gonna do is there a particular event involved or whatever and there's no follow-up if you are taking the time to tag someone in a public post then you have begun the process of inviting them to a thing. And if you don't have a thing to invite them to, wow, that's not a great look, right? I'm going to invite you over to my house, but I'm not going to tell you when, where, how to get there, uh, what the menu is, nothing. You're just invited. Okay, well, that works to just give a generic invite to, like, your best friends and be like, hey, you can show up whenever. But people you don't know that you're inviting to a party, you know, they maybe need a little more information to determine whether or not they're coming. Maybe. So the first thing I always say when I'm planning a big charity event is I start with three principles. Number one, I am the host of this event. It is my job to ensure that everybody is at the event, has a good time. They are, give, they are doing this for me mo for free because it's a charity event and I appreciate you need to appreciate their time and their effort. So I need to put in the time and effort in front of in front to make sure that they have a good time. It is my responsibility to make sure that those invitations are set, that people are followed up with, that all of the information that a prospective player needs to determine if this event is right for them at this moment in their lives is in that invitation. Right? That is one of the most important things I can do as the host for this event. Knowing what charity I'm going to support, knowing um, what the general plan is, you know, that will probably change, but we'll get back to that. Knowing who I'm inviting and knowing that not everyone is right for every single table. And that's okay, right? Like, 
there are people I love to play with, but I would never invite to say a horror game because they don't enjoy that type of game. There are people I love to play with who I would never invite to say, you know, a really crunchy system because that's not what they enjoy. So it's my job as the host to be like, okay, this is what we're playing. This is wh why this is gonna be a thing. Let me think about who I'm inviting. Now, this is not about gatekeeping. This is not about being an asshole and saying that these people can't play with you. This is about knowing who you are inviting and knowing A, what they enjoy and B, what type of player they are, right? Because like, Different people have different play styles and different personalities, and you want everybody at the table to have fun and enjoy themselves. It is your job as the host of this giant charity dinner party to ensure that everybody is having fun. And if you know that these two people have very different play styles and don't enjoy the same kind of things, don't put them at the same table. Right? Like, that's just... It's like etiquette 101 when you're hosting a dinner party, you don't put the people with very, very different economic views right next to each other. It's not gonna be a good time for either of them and it's not gonna be a good time for anyone else at the table. It's your responsibility as the host to think about that, to think about how this group dynamic is going to work. Because that's the other important thing, right? A TTRPG, whether it's D&D, &D, Call of Cthulhu, Witcher, Castle Falkenstein, um, Kids on Bikes, Tales from the Loop, uh, uh, anything, right? Whether it's anything is a group event. And everybody at the event should be having fun. And spoiler alert, that includes the GM. So if you know that there are people whose play styles, whose personalities do not get along, don't put them at the same table. Because I guarantee you, even if theoretically you believe that having X TTRPG personality and why TTRPG personality would be great because they'll bring their viewers to your charity stream and you'll make more money. If the players aren't having fun, the audience will notice and you will not make more money, number one. And number two, I hate to break it to you, but nine times out of ten, those big names aren't going to draw as many people as you think. Now, that could be multiple reasons. Number one, people don't always follow from channel to channel. Actually, that's really, those that do are worthy and we love you and we appreciate you for being like that. But there are people who don't. Uh, the timing for your event may be off, right? Like the particular time when these particular people follow this particular streamer uh, might be different than what time your charity stream is running and therefore they just aren't available to watch. They might catch the VOD and really enjoy it, but they might not be live for the event. Um, it may just not be an event or charity or thing that the people have time for, to support, to view. Now, you will probably get some viewership from those individuals, but do not invite people to your event purely because you think that they will bring views. Don't do it. It is like number one rule of dinner parties. Don't invite somebody to the dinner party just because you think they're famous. No one's gonna have a good time. If you don't actually like that person, it's gonna be really obvious. If you don't actually know that person, it'll be really, really obvious. Um, you want to encourage people to engage and come and have a good time because the more your players have a good time, the more the audience has a good time, 
the more this benefits the charity that you're supporting overall. Now, admittedly, some of this is just basic table etiquette that I believe you should be using at your, as a GM anyways, but it's especially important for things like charity events where you're reaching out to large groups of people where mo some of these people may have never met before. Twitter is a really big space and you may, your particular groups may not entirely overlap with everybody else's particular groups. Um, which is good, so you don't get trapped in a bubble. But if you're going to be introducing new people to people that they have not met before, you need to ensure that, you know, you're not just putting a, you're not just saying, oh, well, I'm going to invite, invite, you know, Matt Mercer to my table because he's Matt Mercer and I will get the 1 million live concurrent views of people that watch Critical Role. I'm sorry to break it to you, that's not going to happen. Uh, people watch Critical Role because of Critical Role and not just Matt Mercer. Um, and your charity event, no matter how much Mr. Mer uh, Matt Mercer would probably love to support it, may not, uh, may not be in the game plan of, um, hey Trig, thanks for that sub, we really appreciate it may not be in the game plan of that particular audience. Just saying. Now, that is not any shade on the fans of Critical Role. That's not any shade on the people who enjoy uh, Matt Mercer. That, you know, I think from whatever I've seen, he is a wonderful, fabulous performer who can work with pretty much anybody that I've seen so far. But if you're just bringing in a big name to bring in a quote unquote big name, without considering the people at the table, how they interact, what this is actually about, then you're doing both sides of that a service, disservice, right? Um, I'm very lucky that I know a bunch of people in this space that were willing to come and help me and were able, and were able and had the time to come and help me run this charity event on January 1st. We did really, really well, and I'm very, very lucky. Um, but some of those people have never played together. Some of those people didn't even know each other or know that they, each other existed because they'd never heard of them. And that's okay. But I knew everybody that I invited, and I n had either played with or interacted with um everybody i had played with uh everybody i invited on some level and i do not know what you're asking And I don't think I want to know. Um, but. I knew everybody who was invited. I knew everybody I had played with. Played at the same table with. Or had engaged in various ways. And chatting at various points with. Or had watched them play in other tabletop events and knew all of these people and could generally gauge their play style, what kind of uh, game they enjoyed, what other kind of things that they're gonna do at the table and you know how that's gonna work together and fit as a whole. So I knew that even if, say for example, you, you know, um, Steven and Trooper had never played at the same table together um, and just, that meant that they could, I knew that they would enjoy it and have a good day. Because at the end of the day, it was about me knowing my players, knowing what was going on, and knowing that these two person people have a personality that will get along and will work together. Um, which 
is a great thing. Um, and knowing that means, again, going back to our metaphor about throwing a dinner party, just like you know, you, you think about at a dinner party, who's sitting next to whom, and yes, that seems really dated concept, but it's really important. You don't put, for example, I was lucky enough to spend some of my years at the UN school. My dad was stationed at the UN. I spent a lot of time hanging out at UN events. You're not going to put the ambassador from Israel right next to, say, the representative from the Palestine at a dinner party. Now you might invite both of them to the event. But you'd keep them at opposite ends of the table. Just for everybody's fun times and copacetic enjoyment. Again, you might have in all these people that you think will get along or do really, really well, but maybe they need to be, you know, this group of people is going to be over here and this group of people is going to be over here. So going back to our invitations, Invitations for a dinner party and invitations for a kid's birthday party are very, very simple, very, very short, very one page. It's where is the event, who is throwing it, what time, date, and general attire theme is going to be included. Five things. Um... Yes, Mal Malkadoshian says it takes a keen sense of social awareness and understanding the strengths and weaknesses of individuals. Yes, it does. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be overwhelming, right? Like, this goes back to Tanya's point, and go back to the my point about invitations as well. Tanya, you know, Cypher of Tear was talking, and her comment was, if you're just speaking into the universe that you want to invite somebody to a thing, and you're not... A, and you're tagging them, which is the first step of an invitation, but you don't have any of the other information to go with that invitation, then that's really, really not good. Um, just throwing that out there. It's not good. It's not polite. It's not fun. But if you take that time, and even if, for example, you throw out into the universe uh, an invitation, and I'm like, okay, if I want to... If I want to go to a play at a table with somebody that I respect for various reasons and think would be great for this event, I do not just randomly go on Twitter and tag them in it. I reach out to them in usually whatever accepted medium of communication they wish. Like, for example continuing with Tanya and Cypher of Tear, she has a business email in her profile. I'm going to send her an email to that. If I know them personally and know them really well and, like, I have an entire, like, messaging line of communication that's a personal messaging communication, I might use that. But if I don't know them that well and there is a preferred means of communication for them, hi, I'm going to use it. Because I want to respect their time. And you don't want to be the random spam caller ever. That's how you get put on red and uh, thrown out. You know, if you've got... If they've got a business email send them an email if you if you know them personally and you can like be like hey you're my friend and you know them that well that you're just gonna be like hey you want to come that's different but you still owe them the same courtesy of a professional invitation that you're going to give everybody else so that you're inviting to this event and when i say invitation i do mean an invitation so like let's Let's talk Charity Vania, which just finished and was a great event. And I appreciated each and every one of you who came, who supported, who did the things. So 
so let's let's uh let's pull this up so I can show you what exactly I think is important in a invitation such as this. So, so this is the actual invitation I sent people to, there we go, make it a little bigger. Everybody can read that. This is what I sent to individuals that I was inviting to this charity stream. Yes, Malkadoshian is correct. Don't publicly ask somebody to an event and just to make them feel guilty so that they will agree. It's like, it's the worst kind of like, I had this problem when I was teaching of trying to explain to some of the boys that I was teaching that unless you are actively dating a girl, do not make a production out of going to pro inviting her to prom or homecoming just to pressure her so she won't say no. Don't make a production out of it. Publicly tagging somebody to be like, hey, so-and-so, why don't you join my charity event? Like, they might not know you exist. They may not, it, then it's just like real awkward. No, uh-uh, they might have lives. They might have things they're doing. Don't, don't be that person, just, don't. Just respect them and you know what? Somebody's gonna say no and that's okay. It may not fit their schedule. It may not be an event that they want to do. They may be real, real tired. They may be looking at time going, ooh, I, I can't fit that into my schedule. I've got like 16 other things that are going around the same time and that is my one day off. Do not take it personal. So this is what I put together. And every... I, I linked this document and this is my invita quote unquote invitation, but every email I sent, every message I sent, I personalized with who I was talking to and said, Hey, this is a general information. Let me know what you think. Love it. If you could join us, if you don't, I understand here's to new things in the new year. Very simple, polite emails, messages, depending on who I was talking to or what I was doing. Um, so this is a page typed not very you know not very long but it provides all of the information that i as a player would want to make my informed decision about whether this event is right for me to attend for whatever reason right i'm putting together a charity fundraiser stream that will be played on my channel and then i give the channel name so that people can go and look and see if they if the vibe for my channel or what i do meets with what they want or what they want their name attached to to support Fisher House Foundation and I give them the name of the charity that we are supporting because some people may not want to support particular charities and that's okay also side note vet your charities check out them check them out on charity um you know on charity raiders and make sure that they're doing good things and that they're not wasting their funds all of these are important five o Make sure that there are 5013C. All of these are important. Um, I give a brief explanation of what Fisher House does. I give what time the charity, the charity stream will be a 12 hour D&D &D meat grinder on New Year's Day, 2023, starting at 12 p.m. Eastern and going until 12 a.m. Eastern. I am looking for players Oops, well, that, I feel really stupid that there was a typo in that for you, an entire month and nobody told me. To play in one of four three-hour sessions, 12, 3, 6, and 9 p.m. 
I've told them in those four sentences what this is about, who this is for, what it's going to be, what the general theme is going to be, right? Because it's a D&D &D meat grinder. It's telling you what we're playing. I'm telling you when it's going to be and how I'm breaking this up, right? I'm breaking it into four three-hour sessions. I'm not asking you to play 12 hours. Um, I'm also not asking, uh, I'm telling them and giving them informed information. And that is in the very first paragraph and that is the very first piece of information. The next, the next paragraph is about, about how I want to run the game, right? This is about how I want to plan the game. This is just as if you are telling them the people a theme, dress code, anything like that. The theme is going to be Castlevania, a la the original Castlevania video games. Players will be playing level 6 D&D &D characters limited to choices from the Forgotten Realms and Ravenloft books. I've not yet had the opportunity, and then I go to explain why I'm making this limitation. I made this limitation because I, as a GM, have not read all of Eberron, Theros, Ravnica, or Exandria, and I want to be able to make rulings as quickly and as fairly as possible in the game. Like. There's just too much now out there that for me, as a GM who is running a charity event, to be able to make quick, informed, polite, and appropriate rulings at the table be like, I can't do that and be like, I can't, I'm going to limit this. And limiting that is okay. Hi. This is also a general GM tip. Limiting player choices for a charity stream, for a um, particular game that you are running is okay. You are not a bad GM for saying you can't just randomly bring in this, you know, combination of, you, you know, you can't just randomly bring this class species combination that I have never heard of to a table and expecting the GM to be totally okay with that. Maybe it doesn't fit the rules of the world that they're playing in. Maybe it doesn't fit the um, setting, maybe it, you know, expecting a GM to be totally okay with everything and every idea that exists, maybe not. <laughs> GM, having limits is sometimes a good thing and is it very important for a GM, particularly a GM who is running a stream like this, where there is going to be, for example, in this game, particular stream that I ran, there were 17 players to keep track of all of their stats, all of their abilities, all of their spells, features, traits. Do they have this skill? Do they not have this skill? Is this going to work in this general environment? Yes, no, maybe. That's a lot of moving pieces. And by me limiting it to books from the Forgotten Realms, which is basically the core books, Tasha's, um, Wardenkainen's, Xanathar's, uh, and a couple other, uh, you know, and the Ravenloft books, because vampire was the theme. Um, Yes, and Malkadoshian states, there is nothing wrong with having boundaries as a DM as long as the DM explains their reasoning for those boundaries. Exactly. And sometimes that reasoning is just, it doesn't fit in this game, I'm sorry. Um, and it doesn't fit in this world, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> thank you, Faye. Hooray for creative constraints. Unstable Dio says, some characters aren't suited to a given set of themes. Exactly. If I tell you we are going to be playing a horror game about existential dread and you're like, I want to bring my total comedy character 
that I made for the lols, I'm gonna be like, nah. Please don't. You are not in any way, shape, or forms helpful in this situation. Hawkeye says, sometimes limits make you more creative than open season. Exactly. I then... I then made an exception for the two subclasses that I personally wrote. If one of the players wanted to play either a Waffle House Cleric or um, Way of the Boundless uh, Bounding Tides uh, Monk, I would have let them do that. Because I wrote those mechanics and I know them, right? Like, I know how those mechanics function. Nobody decided they wanted to, which was totally okay, and I have no problem with that. Um, I then informed them of the important, a couple important themes, rules that we were going to be using for mechanics purposes so that they could make, not all of them, but important ones that would help them make their determination. Um, we will be playing a rule with resurrection sickness where each time the character is revived below zero HP, the next time they start with one failed death save. I decided on this as a thematic, this is as it is thematic to both the original Castlevania games, which if you've watched me play them on this stream, you know they're deadly. Like you, you just die. They're hard. They're, they're not easy. And the only healing you get is wall chicken very occasionally if you can find it. Um, I have decided this is both thematic to the both the original Castlevania games and the concept of a meat grinder in general, which is true. Like, if the point of the, a meat grinder is a D&D &D concept where, admittedly, you have multiple people coming in and playing through things and um, dying frequently. However, I have discovered that a true meat grinder is almost impossible to do on stream if you are both the GM and the producer and just running everything. Because you need to have someone separate who can funnel in more people into the call to... Um, and that's just too much, and it wasn't worth it. So we did this modified meat grinder with meat grinder kind of rules. Um, everybody playing through the same things, and the map was locked. But every team that pushed exposed more of the map to the team before it. Um, it meant that they were getting the benefits and doing things. Uh, there are lots of things that happened because of that. Um, Although this is a meat grinder designed to be deadly to player characters and designed to be around the darker themes tied to tropes of vampires and Dracula. Ooh, look, I'm telling people that we're talking about Dracula, we're talking about these vampire themes, um, all of these kind of things. This is going to hopefully... This is going to be a hopefully fun time for all. Safety tools will be used throughout the game. If you do not tell your players that you are using safety tools and you do not use safety tools, I don't want to play with you. Now, what safety tools you are choosing may be based on what you find works best for that particular game, works best for that particular stream. That's okay, but you need to tell your players what safety tools you're using. Um, ah, Malkadoshian, you're not familiar with the term safety tool. Okay, so a safety tool is a generic term that has developed in TTRPGs about ways to communicate that particular material in a game is... either not to a player's choice or more importantly harmful to a player in ways that is not acceptable so for our exam um uh for example we're, we'll stick on the safety tools for this particular game we used during the stream we used a word was called the x n and o cards and that meant that i had zoom chat up the entire stream, and if there were any issues or things that came up during the gameplay that I felt people needed to check in on, or if people um, were uncomfortable with, they could put just an 
I would put an O question mark in chat. For example, spoiler alert for the charity stream, if you want to go watch it, the VODs are currently, there's one long VOD, you can watch it. Um, or I've broken it up into four highlights of each of the sessions. Those highlights will be going up on YouTube as individual um, VODs uh, probably tomorrow. Um, but if you're watching this in the future, you can find the link. I'll link them under the YouTube thing and go from there. Um, but I had the chat open and say, for example, when, spoiler alert, Simon's character gets possessed at, well, when a character failed their charisma save against vampires, uh, against Dracula feeding on them and gets possessed and turned against the party, I'm putting an O question mark in chat because that leads to, is the party okay with possession? Are people okay with um, this? The player had opportunities to try and overcome this. Unfortunately, didn't end up working. He just kept rolling so badly. Um, is this okay? And then all of my players are putting O as saying this is okay. All of this is okay. If, for example, a player had put an N in the chat, we would have backtracked, we would have shifted, I would have changed things up. Because that means that they are uncomfortable with what is in the game and it is approaching a point where they're not okay with this. I would have shifted. If somebody had put an X in chat, that means that they are Xing this content. They don't want this in the game. It is too much. We would have immediately gone to break. I would have retconned the whole thing. We would have figured something out that would make narrative sense, but would not have included content that the player or players were uncomfortable with in this game. So that is a particular type of safety tool. The other really big one that's used frequently and I use for every game I run, whether it's a charity one shot, a long term stream, a short term four shot, any game I run on or off stream, I use what is called a lines and veils chart. Um, and that is a information that I it's a worksheet that I put together. I share with all of my players. Um, it is an anonymous information. Yeah, Malkadoshi, and see, that's the thing is, a lot of us used these, we're, if we're of the older generation, we used these same kind of concepts at the table because we thought that was just what you were supposed to do as a polite host and good GM at the table. But we never used the official terms for it. And now that there are terms and tools in place, it's a lot easier. Um... I'll link below when I put this on YouTube as well, the um, safety toolkit created by, or uh, collated by uh, Kiana and uh, Lauren. It's a great resource put together by them. They did a really good job with that. Um, but lines and veils are, if something is, a player puts anonymously on this cheat is a line, that means it will not appear in this game. I, for myself, have a hard line with suicide as comedy. I I will not play a game where suicide is played for comedy. It, it I, I have a hard line against it. Nope, not going to do it. Um, I also have get lines against sexual assault in my games. Um, child abuse. Uh, and I have veils on thing. Yeah, the t safety toolkit is a great start. Versus veils, which is... A veil is a, um, it's okay to exist, a player is saying it's okay for this to exist in the world, but I don't want to dwell on it. I don't want detailed depictions on it. If it happens, I would rather have it a fade to black. And I don't want to talk about it in detail. Uh, for me, that's suicide in general. Um, also things like, um, general harm to children. I have a hard line against killing children in my games, um, actively killing children in my games. But if you're watching, you know that I play in the Witcher universe, and so you can kind of assume that there are probably a lot of 
not good things happen to a not all of good people, but it exists. It doesn't mean I have to talk about it. Um, and so most of these are like generally okay things that most people, but at the same time that there, you might be playing a game and this is why I talk about it. Like this is designed to be deadly to player characters and designed to revolve around the darker themes and tropes of vampires and Dracula in particular, right? Like, Dracula possesses people and forces them to do things. That's one of the things that he does. Go back to the original Bram Stoker novel, trapping John Har Jonathan Harper in a basement with the brides of Dracula and forcing him to write his narrative, you know, send letters home uh, to his wife being like, no, everything's good, everything's great. While he's slowly going insane from all of these things, was a uh is a theme and by telling my players straight up that this is a theme that may come up in the games they can you know these potential people that i am inviting to this game they can make an informed choice about whether this is an event that they want to be to yeah malkadoshian it is a great the safety toolkit is a great thing that came out um it is a it is a great collating of the various types of safety tools that exist around the internet so that people can find them in one place and put them together in a way that works for their individual table. Not all, I haven't found all of the tools to be useful for me and my players, but that doesn't mean that other tables might not find them also useful. Um, and that's okay. Like, the fact that you have different styles and approaches to what you're using to encourage safety at the table, that is the most important. That means that there are different ways that different players with different or different GMs can integrate it into their games and more people can benefit from it. And that's all good. That is my opinion on that. Um, I also included this. I also recognize that not all players enjoy working together and I want to do everything to accommodate that. If you are free to join and want to participate in the event, I want to do everything to accommodate individuals, ensure that players are only at tables with others they feel comfortable playing with. There might be multiple reasons why, and it's not about I'm inviting horrible people who are active harmers to the community to come and play. No, 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 I'm just like, yo, you and you may have entirely different play styles and will not enjoy being at the table, so I'm gonna do what I can to, because while you're both great players, you, person X might be entirely comedy focused and person Y might be really, really uh, into the tragedy. And while some comedy and tragedy can overlap, it may not always work for everybody. You don't want the, you know, I can separate that out. I can make it easier for people. Be like, it's okay. I can put you at separate tables. It's fine. It's just like at a wedding when you know there's nothing wrong with having this group of friends and this group of friends both invited to the same event, but you know that they're not the same kind of people like your work friends and your friends from college are not the same kind of people. And that doesn't mean that either of them are bad people. It just means that you don't put them necessarily at the same table at that wedding. Yeah, keep the dungeon crawlers together and the drama kids together for maximum fun for all involved. Exactly, exactly. And you know, you might also know that some of those people might cross over and be willing to work together. And so you can mix that up a little bit, but that doesn't mean that Everybody has to get along. I'm going to spoil something you learned from preschool. Not everybody has to get along when you're adults. You can't be assholes to each other, but you don't have to like or get along with every single person that you come into contact in the entire world. And if you think that you can, I'm glad you're running for sainthood. I'm going to sit here and just be a mortal human. Yep. 
Yeah, exactly. Don't force oil and water to mix. It doesn't happen without disastrous results. And there's nothing inherently wrong with oil or water. Olive oil is great. Water is really important. Both of these things don't need to be forced together. <laughs> Enjoy your lurk, Jim. Um, and for those of you who are wondering, we are currently on Earth third rock from the sun. Um, and if you get that reference, welcome to uh, my age demographic. Um, I also threw this in. I also understand that the holiday season is a busy time for everyone and that everyone has a lot going on. If you are able and willing to join this meet grinder event, please fill out this Google form ranking your preference for time and any information about players you would rather not have at your table. No one but me is going to see this. If you are not able to enjoy the event, I totally understand and hope you we can play together at some table soon. And then I gave them a form. All I want, this is everything that is the first introduction as a GM to my charity stream that I need to give to my players. I'm telling them what we're doing, who is benefiting, how long it's going to be, when it's going to be, how it's going to be generally structured for three hour sessions, what the themes of the game are going to be, some general rules, basic li basic limitations that might be, you know, somebody might be like, nah, I'm only going to play Eberron games from now on. I, I don't know who, but that could be a choice that somebody makes. Um, and this information would be important for them to know about whether or not they're going to come. Um, I'm including the general, the first of the major, you, you know, mechanics that we're tweaking for the purpose of this game. Uh, but that does not mean that that was all of them. And in fact, it wasn't. So we see here, this is the f barest, you know, this is what I think, you know, it doesn't take long and it's four paragraphs, one, two, three, four paragraphs. It's polite. It's professional. I can send this to somebody who I maybe don't know as well as I know other people by sending it to their professional contact point, whether that's their DMs, their email, their um, whatever. But again, remembering and recognizing and taking the time to go to somebody's Twitter page and be like, hey, how do you want to be contacted? Okay, you have this email particularly for this information. Let me send you an email and not just roll up in your DMs like I think I can. That ain't cool. Um, but this is the introduction, right? Like, this is step two of your charity stream. Step one is determining that you're going to do a charity stream and that you are going to run a tape and you're going to plan what date and time and what game you're running. Oh, I, um, you could, I did not in this particular one because I included it in the Google form that I shared with everybody. Um, like if you're, I, and because I gave them a particular direction here about who I'm supporting and what we're doing. And if they, you know, you could have, and again, it would not be a bad thing. I firmly recommend it for other things and other events like that, uh, to re add a link to the foundation or the charity that you're supporting. Um, and that can be if to the benefit as well. And it can help your individual players and people make informed decisions. Cause again, it's, it's not, some people may not want to support particular charities, um, and that's okay. They may not align with your particular morals. They may be um, other things and reasons why you don't wish to support them personally. You might have a different charity that you believe in does that same kind of work better, and that's okay. But allowing people to make that informed decision is part of inviting them to a charity stream. Um, 
So now you've invited people, right? You've you've made up your invitation. You know when the event, you know, you've planned, you've generally selected a date, selected a time, selected what game you're going to play. You've sent an invitation to a bunch of people. Hi, I'm going to tell you straight up. Keep a list, Google form, of who you've invited, who said yes, who said no, and who you haven't heard from, and then follow up in a couple, like, four days. Right? And, for example, I was planning 16 to uh, 20 players. 20 players was going to be my max, right? Because that's five players per session for the four sessions that I ran. 16 was what I was figuring I was going to get. I got lucky. I got 17 that ended up actually being 16 because of just the way the numbers ended up working out. Um, because unfortunately people were unwell and we hope they feel better soon. Uh, but that meant that I actually sent invitations to like 25, 30 people. You were going to get people who say no, and that's okay. Do not take it personally that somebody says no, they cannot come to your particular event that you're putting together. And don't bug them for reasons, right? Like, n it's none of your business. They might have life events. They might have other things that's going on. They may just be tired and are not, don't have the spoons to be like, I need to be on a charity thing for four hours. It's none of your business. You can leave that alone and not bother them. If they say no, oh, well, great. Sorry. Hope you have a great time. Catch you next time. Go from there. It takes zero effort to be polite to somebody. It can be so easy to take a no to an invitation like this as a personal thing. Rather than just being like, it's no to the event, not necessarily no to you. And that's okay. Sometimes you're gonna get rejected. And unfortunately, that's life. So the way to deal with that is always invite at least five to ten more people than you actually need for an event. Expecting them to say, a bunch of people to say no. Oh no, Hawkeye, what I usually say is if somebody declines to come, um, I say, thanks, uh, you know, I, I usually send a, that's okay, you know, no, not a problem. Thanks for considering it. Maybe next time, have a good day. Just generic, polite acceptance of their decline. What if more people accept than anticipated or required? Um, then I have more people that are playing and I have even more fun. I never invite more people than I could actually handle. Like, if we had 30 people, it would, that would be a lot, but we didn't get that many. Um, I actually invited about 20, 25 people. Um, and ended up with 17. And... I would have just added more people to the separate groups, yeah. Because I already split it up. And that would have been fine. Like, when I got 17 yeses, that meant I was like, okay, so I'm not going to have five per table or four per table. I'm going to have five in one session and then four in all the other sessions. 
and it ended up I was going to have four in the last session but people got sick last minute and I hope they feel better and it is not in any way shape or form their fault but yeah I would have just added more people now that's different people have different standards and I freely admit to having run large-scale dinner parties and events before now some people may not be comfortable if you're both the GM and the producer right like if you're running if if you're one or the other um you might have different ways of dealing with this but if you're both there usually ends up being some sort of balance you can achieve by doing something like um adding in more players making sure you're only inviting the the maximum number of people you can handle um and having what are round two invitations for those people who that you invite in round one who never respond the polite decline the polite negative rsvps are never a problem the bigger ones that you feel worse about are you send out something into the ether and you never hear a yes no or maybe um sometimes your email or message got lost sometimes they're on you know they've got the spam filter up sometimes they've got other things that are going on in their life and they just don't see it and that's okay don't judge people about why they don't respond to you just be like all right i've got these other four or five um uh people that i could ask as like secondary to your core usually closer friends who i'd be like hey I need to round out this group Can, do, are you free um but still treat them to the same level of respect as you gave everybody else by giving them the invitation and all these things um unstable dios asks did you have any additional mods to help facilitate the actual gameplay no i i did everything myself i did everything myself um i had mods in chat to help with that but i was running production i was monitoring the donations to make sure that we you know i accounted for all of the uh benefits or uh hindrances that the party was going to experience i then uh monitored all of the streaming i would had uh was running the game i did everything Hawkeye asks, would you recommend doing just one or the other when doing it the first time? It really depends on you, who you are. Like for me, I have done large events like this before. And I am comfortable running production and GMing at the same time because I do that regularly, right? Like I have, for those of you who don't know, well, you can check it out. I have them on YouTube. I have multiple long-running games. Uh, the longest right now is The Witcher. We're going um, TTRPG, Witcher Roads Home. We're picking up with season five, which will be our last season of Witcher Roads Home. Um, the week of Martin Luther King weekend. Um, but I run production and everything for GMing for that game. And so I'm very used to it. Now, somebody who may not be as used to both the, the production aspect or, uh, you know, GMing for multiple groups of people over a long period of time may want to choose to do one or the other for their first charity stream. Um, there are some great people out there who you can contact uh, who will do production for streams for you. Um, DC Lasser is one that I know of. He's done some really great work for a bunch of people. Actually, I will give him a shout out so that you can that work. Yes, it did. Um, 
you, uh, he does a bunch of really great stuff. He's talked about a lot. He does a lot of streams talking about how to run production better, how to do a lot of these things. He's a really great person. Go follow him and check out his stuff. Um, you, but if you are a person who feels comfortable doing both, then you need to make sure that you are paying attention to the invitations that are going out, who's saying yes, what party, who is saying no, what times people are accommodating. And when I sent this form, I basically said, these are the four time sessions, select in those four times, you know, those four session time zones, rank them by your availability like write one two three or four what is the best time for you based on one two three or four um i was very very lucky that i managed to get all 17 players scheduled for either their first or second choice and that was great <laughs> I did a really good job and I had people who were in, and I got really lucky because some of that was just based on what people wanted to select and what their first choice was which was really good um, but that meant that you could work with people and manipulate your, your table setting a little bit easier um, so that was stage two right like stage one is sending the invitations stage two is accepting the invitations and then arranging the schedule, putting together the assets. Um, exactly, it's uncommon that you get that many people to line up so well with times. I was so lucky. Um, uh, so now that you've sent the invitations, you can start doing what I did while you waited for responses, which is start building assets like overlays and um, deciding on additional rule changes that you were going to be making. Um, once you started getting, once I started getting responses, I had, again, like I had a spreadsheet of who I had asked, who had said yes already, who had said no, uh, who, um, who was maybes that I followed up with about four or five days later to be like, hey, you know, are, you know, have you, were you able to figure out your schedule yet? Or, you know, are you going to be able to join us? Um, yes, great, let me add you. No, well, maybe next time I look forward to it. Thanks so much, blah, 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 blah. Um, which is not to say that those are important, uh, those are unimportant communications. They're actually very important communications. And being polite and professional and not taking it personally when people have to say, hey, I got to take a couple days because I don't want my schedule is going to be that far out. And then when you, they get back to you a couple days later, I'm sorry, the schedule is just not going to work out. Well, that's okay. I'm sorry it wouldn't work out this time. Maybe next time. Um, I have, you know, keeping that list of who said yes and who said no is very useful because it meant that I could go like, all right, so I've got all of these people. I've think I've got all the people that are up. Oh, I've got three people who've said yes, but I haven't got any Google form answers from. Let me follow up with them so that I can get those answers. And then once you have the people who are committed, who've said yes, and have filled out your form with the time selects, then I could sit there and look at like what times where people were available and break people into groups. Excuse me. Now, This leads into stage three of running such a large event and such a big thing. And those are very important. And that is the limitations of a large charity stream and scheduling for such a thing. Smaller charity streams where it's going to be a one shot, three hours, you've got one group of people, it's going to be very simple. You have limitations, but you have fewer. The biggest problem with having a group like a big event like this is I had 17 players 
during the month of December leading up to the 1st of January with multiple holiday, religious holidays and work holidays and all of these things, I knew going into it that there was no way I would be able to do an actual session zero for all of those groups. It was just the scheduling was not going to allow for that. However, I could create a virtual session zero by creating discord groups for each session, inviting everybody, introducing them to who is going to be here in this group, who's not, getting them to start chatting together in the discord, uh, making sure they had all of the information like here, I've got a D&D Beyond character uh, campaign built. If you create your and a roll 20, if you create your, and that's the other th point you have to make, you have to determine what platform you are going to use to run the game. I used a combination of D&D Beyond and Roll20 because it's easier to create D characters in D&D Beyond. And then if you have the Beyond 20 integration, um, you can just roll in D&D Beyond and then have it roll in Roll20, but Roll20 has a better mechanic to view dice rolls for players. Um, it also has a better map system. Uh, it's a it's a much better device as a table virtual tabletop versus what I really think of as D&D Beyond is a tool to create characters and has a is a virtual bookstore. It's great and I love it for that, but it's not going to replace a virtual tabletop. Um, by giving my player groups this opportunity to chat, by sharing with them this inf campaign information, this Roll20 information, I shared with all of them the lines and veils sheet immediately for them to keep track of. I shared with them uh, this document, which was the general rules I set up for this game for players that were based, there were everything that we were modifying based on the fact that this was going to be a quote unquote meat grinder um, idea and that we're changing things up. We're using donations for certain things. All of these were things that I was paying attention to. And then I said, hey, this is what I'm considering. These are the donation tiers. Are any of these going to cause problems before I post them? to the internet before I share them with the world. Let's talk about them. Is there things about this that you want to change, that you want to tweak, that you want to make better or worse? All of those were options. Please excuse me. I'm going to have to be right back as I check on the dog because it sounds like she got into something. Hold on, please enjoy the chill tunes.
Sorry about that. Um, we were just paying attention because my dog is a little older and we want her to keep, you know, we don't want to ignore her. Um, but yes. So we were talking about rules and things. You've established who you've invited. You've given them the dates and times and all the relevant information for them to make an informed decision. Not all of it, but enough for them to make an informed decision. Um... Because informed consent is really important. Um, you are giving them information and allowing them to be work with each other. Now, as Tanya was saying yesterday, if the information you're sharing with your players does not include how you're going to address safety, how, what you're going to do about a session zero. In my case, it was all about, um, the session zero information was, uh, going to be, because I didn't know who was playing and how many people I was going to have yet. I, when I followed up with people after they said yes or no, I would inform them. I was like, Hey, we're not going to do it. I explained how we were going to do things. Um, if this had been a regular one shot where I'd be like, or even one of my regular streamed games, um, I would have included when we're going to do a session zero or ask for people's availability about timing for a session zero and include in the session zero, we're going to create characters together. We're going to talk about the uh, specific rules we're tweaking for the game, um, goals and things that people necessarily want out of this game and what kind of attitude we're going to go for. All of this is a thing. I also, as a GM, except for big things like what the, this 12 hour charity stream, I prefer to have my players make characters together. Because I think at session zero, because I think that integrates better with having players attached to the world, having players attached to each other. Um, you know, start building connections that you can RP off of or little points that you can bring up later and tie to how the game is going to go. A 12 hour charity stream where I am running 17 players through f in four sessions is not going to have that allowance. It just wasn't. The people, the number, pure number of players I was creating, playing with, the pure number of the, um, yes, it'll, why did it ping on that one? Um, it also helps fuel creativity in your fellow players by having a group session. They can build ideas off of one another. Exactly, Malkadoshian, exactly. You can work together, you can build story together. All of these things are great ideas. Um, by giving my players this group of rules, now admittedly we didn't, we weren't going to have that group session, but I could do all of the same thing virtually by building group chats for them, giving them the rules, asking them questions about the rules, be being available for to answer any questions they have, not just about rules, but about character ideas and character concepts. Um, like when Mandy, uh, Lady Luck, it was like, hey, I want to have this, I want to see, follow this idea that Dracula is a prince in a castle. Is he going to be my one? So that I want to play my Disney princess. I'm like, we'll do this. We will have, let's go for it. Now, maybe not everything comes up because it's a charity one shot and I've got to highlight multiple people and encourage multiple people at the table who may or may not have played together before. But having those ideas and bouncing them off also gives me ideas to bounce off of. Um, and by giving my players the concept and the information, it helps them 
feel more comfortable, feel less stilted. Uh, you aren't just dropping people in a group and be like, all right, well, you're here, what are you doing? That's not a great way to run a charity, uh, to run any game, and we'll come back to that. Um, ideally, if you are running a charity stream, you have a session zero. Any game that you are going to run long term, you have a session zero. You might have multiple session zeros leading up to that one premiere or beginning of the game, whether that's on stream or off. You know? But if you are doing even just a one shot, a general session zero is important where you discuss what the expectations for the game are, who's playing, who's going to be doing things. Um, Exactly. Session zero is just a great idea so everyone can get on the same page for expectations and general overall world atmosphere. Exactly. Exactly. Why can I not hear? Okay. Oh, it's just the song that's playing. Okay. I was like, pretzel, why you no work? Oh, it's just the song. Um, all right. So we've talked a little bit about um, how gameplay would work, how you're going to talk to people about gameplay, how you're going to run things. All of these are important, and all of these are important to share with your players as you go. Um, why does my hair look so bad? Okay, we'll just going to ignore that. Um, but, but, you are a host and a producer. So now you need to consider what assets you have what maps you're using, what, you know, announcements you're going to be sharing. Share those announcements on public media. Put them in um, uh, ways and creations so that your players can take those media announcements and share them with their audience, right? Like, if it's on Twitter, make sure you tag all of the players that are going to be in there so that the players can see it and can go back and be like, all right, I've got this set up. I'm going to go ahead and take this tweet and, you know, take that information and share it. Or if you've got a media asset like I did, which basically turned into a GIF because I was having lots of fun <laughs> um, and with it and be like, all right, take this and send it to the players directly if they want to use that for their, you know, promotional materials. Share those promotional materials specifically with a number of people. Um, but if you are... If you are inviting people that have quote-unquote clout or are famous in the TTRPG sphere, you want to do them the courtesy of then sharing that promotional material for them to facilitate their own career, you know, information and careers and share with. Um, if you are using software where you're going to use actual product, you know, actual... Um, PR shots from players. Talk to people, players about that. 
and get those PR shots, so that, headshots, so that you can use them in that material and then share that promotional material with the players before you set it live, right? Like, say, hey, this is what we're going to use, you know, this is what I'm thinking of using, this is how it's set up this way, are you okay with this? Yes, no, all right. What is your major problem? Where can we fix it? Go from there. Because you want people to feel like they're agreeing with what you're going to say about them in public. Exactly. Why did you use that photo? That is one of my worst. It's because it's the photo you gave me. If you want me to use a better photo, give me a better photo. Welcome in, Cold Drake. But you can do all of, like, have that set up, have that easily to do, share that with your players, share that with everybody that you can think of before you send it out into the universe, right? Like, the internet is forever, it never forgets, even when people delete things. Have somebody else proofread your announcements and your PR stuff because I hate to be the one to tell you this, you will make a typo. There will be one. There will probably be more than one, but there will be at least one typo. And because of that, you will uh, have the problem. Which, by the way, I guess I should tell you that the, uh, the charity, um, that you, that the charity campaign is still up and I will probably close it in the end of the day. Uh, but if you want to, you know, continue to support the charity, uh, stream, it, or, uh, you can, it's there. Um, but <laughs> because of that, you need to make sure that all of the assets, all of the promotional material, all of the overlays, um, double check with your players. And this is one of the things that I had as a form on this Google form for players who said, yes, how do you wish to be referred to? What is the handle you want me to put on the overlay? I knew I was going to be in and out too quickly for me to be like, I can't put everybody's character name on the overlay. That would just be way too much effort and was not going to happen. But I can put pe what people want to be called on the overlay and if you do it as part of this google form when people are saying yes then you can just copy and paste copied and paste into my spreadsheet about who was playing what pl game that they were playing and then the minute i'm making that overlay for that you know general overlay for that game i'm just copy and pasting there we go easy peasy so i've got I've got promotional assets, I've got overlays, I've got checking with my per, uh, players about, hey, these are the rules that we're modifying to run for this thing. Do you have questions? Are there things you feel are would be a problem from a promotional tailor standpoint? Do you think that there are better ways we could do this? No, yes, let's go, let's see where we're at. And even though we did not have an in-person session zero like you should for every charity game, we still were able to talk about everything that you should, you have to talk about at a session zero virtually, right? Through text and through group chat. Yeah, it's nice to have a uh, boilerplate, but sometimes it doesn't always work. Uh, you need to experience some things. But... 
boilerplate doesn't always work and you want to be able to focus in on what you have and what you need and where you want to go starting with a general idea is great but you're going to need to facilitate it to your own standards and your own needs and wants based on your table and what you're doing for that charity stream So once you have invited people, gotten people, uh, arranged your scheduling, which is like arranged who's playing at what table, arranged what rules you're going to, or mechanics you're going to adjust and modify for this adjusting rules and modifying rules for a D&D &D game is fine. Having homebrew rules is fine. Tell your players what those homebrew rules are in advance. Yes, I do game day count uh, game day countdown posts. Uh, how soon do you release all of this info days or weeks ahead of a time? Exactly. Um, I do game day countdown posts. Uh, I did some of them, again, because it was the holiday, things got a little amorphous. I tried to do one every day for the last five days leading up to the game. I think I got, like, I missed one. But it's fine. Um, y you know, there were hours of prep and advertising and planning and arranging that went into this. Yeah, and don't surprise people with gameplay cha changes. It's uncool and can easily, uh, Maladokujin says, don't surprise people with uh, gameplay changes. It's uncool and can easily devolve into a rules discussion, which isn't fun. Exactly. If I'm in the middle of a game and I need to make a ruling, and that's why I limited, right, like the, the rule, what books people were gonna be able to play in so that I as a GM, in this moment where I've got a game that I'm going uh, literally running for 12 hours <laughs> and kept running and we went over because that's what's going to happen. I knew we were going to go over, but you needed to let people have fun. I need to not be confused about rules that are set up. Um, I made an error in one of the games and Kay, Kay Danfear was correct, entirely correct. And when she pointed out, it's like, no, but this is the rule for the spell. I'm like, good, we'll move on. I'm not going to get upset about it. Um, but if I'm tweaking a rule in advance, then I need the players to know that. I, I, this is what I need to do. Yeah, um... If I'm changing rules like that, like, for example, the general rules I made for this particular one, uh, you know, charity stream, we're all about facilitating the feel of a Castlevania video game and a, the modifying of a meat grinder. So I added the rule about resurrection sickness, you know, after dropping below zero HP and being revived, you have one failed death save until you were able to complete a long rest. Each subsequent time you drop below zero HP and are revived before a long rest, you lose one hit die. I love the video game trope of multiple lives. So you'll have two extra lives when you die and are not revived, but you'll start back at either the last save room or the beginning of a zone without the rest of the party. After that, you are dead, dead, and only resurrection could heal you. And I don't know why that sentence went away. I'm going to just type that in there because I might use this uh, rule set again for things. Uh, yeah, it's like, you dead dead. Um, 
Yeah, Cold Drake, I've played in a homebrew... Okay, so Cold Drake says, um, I was offered a spot in a homebrew game, um, world game that was presented as standard D&D 5e. Then he slipped in a tweet about short rests taking a week and long rests a month, regaining spell slots. Um... Yeah, like, I've played in a game that had the long rules set up, which are basically from 2nd edition. Um, the problem is that fit, I have done that, and 5th edition is not set up to do that correctly. It just mechanically, the two don't work well, at least in my opinion. I don't mind the conception of having a long, you know, a sh we ended up actually with a short rest being overnight, 8 hours, and a long rest being a week. Rather than... Uh, a short rest a week and a long rest uh, a month. Yeah, so it's just... It depends what game you're doing, but again, if you know that and want to play that kind of game, if the player, if the GM tells you that in advance, in either in the secondary comment, before you get to promotional material and the game getting ready to go live, that's important. Like, in the invitation I sent, I mentioned the fact that the resurrection sickness would be a thing, and that we are, um, deadly to players, and that there are darker themes and tropes. I didn't get into the specific rules, because the general invitation was going to cover enough information that these rules, when I shared them with players, were good enough for players to be able to work with. Um... Long rest you have, must be within a room that you are able to make safe, i.e. have only one entry point to barricade, have something with a ward spell or a tiny hut spell. There are also two save rooms on the map. There actually ended up being five because the map just got bigger. Um, entering them immediately grants the benefits of a long rest because we were playing Castlevania, which is basically a video game, and just like in Symphony of the Night or Harmony of Dissonance or Area of Innocence, you can find save rooms on the map where you can save and then immediately recover all of your health, stamina, and all of these things. Um, it's great. Pray at this shrine. Recover everything. Um, short rest. You may attempt to short rest anywhere, but creatures might find you. Uh, one of the donation tiers is the pork chop dinner. Grants an immediate short rest to the whole party. So... Uh, Faye says, Faye Sun says, currently I'm hyper-focusing on those old-school style games now, and I, so I have two separate Worlds Without Numbers campaign I am playing in next week. <laughs> Good luck! Worlds Without Numbers is a lot of fun, but it is very deadly. Don't get hit. Just, just don't get hit. Um, I informed people about healing that there was no healing penalties to healing magic to players. The donation of the wall chicken will immediately grant each member of the party 50% of their max HP. If this healing puts the players over their max, those points become temporary HP. Oh, you survived your first session. Congrats, Faye. I am happy for you that you survived. But yeah, so I told people about the map, how it was going to be set up, and that there was a donation tier, there are secret rooms to be revealed, which one group of players did find the secret tunnel, and then ended up fighting uh, a dwarf vampire in the secret tunnel. They survived, and are currently running around the castle, probably. Um... And there are relic rooms, and two peop two groups found the relic, uh, two different relic rooms. It was beneficial and helpful. Uh, candelabras, I explained. I told them about the hearts, which were going to help, which were really helpful. All of these things that I changed in the rule set to make donations more engaging, to make the game more like Castlevania video games, I informed the players of at the time in advance, had the opportunity to say, share these with the dot players and be like, this is what we're changing. This is how I'm thinking of phrasing it. Is this a problem? 
do we want to go back and edit these? Should I rechange these? And a couple of these I tweaked based on, you know, for clarification, share, tweaked some information. But by and large, these were the rules I shared, you know, the, the what I shared with the players and what I got back from the players was, you know, the same thing. It didn't, went, the minute we went to, from when I shared them to when we went live, there wasn't a big change. Um, so you've got your invitations that you've sent, you've planned your assets, you shared those promotional assets, you shared the rules, or you've had a session zero. Ideally, you've had a session zero. Um, and again, like the reason I didn't have a session zero really did come down to just the holiday timing and 17 players. Um, holiday timing meant that it wasn't gonna happen very easily. Um, the next step you as a producer or a GM have is to be ready and on time and communicating with the players the day of the game so that you can facilitate people coming in, be ready, introduce players if this is the first time that they've, you know, if the minute people end up in the green room, if people don't know each other and have not met before, introduce them, have a minute to ask if they have any questions, remind people that you as the GM will have the chat for the video, whichever video sharing service you're using, whether that's Zoom, Meet, uh, Teams, um, whatever Google is calling itself, Google Meet, I think it's calling itself now instead of Google Hangout. Um, you know, whichever platform you are using for the video to facilitate the virtual gameplay, you have a chat window open and you have that open permanently and remind players that it is there for communication, particularly about safety tools. Do not ever just not have a way that you can visually see during the session of communicating with your players. Also, fun note and a small suggestion, don't cover your players' pictures. Make sure you can see them so that you can engage with them and maybe check in if their body language starts visibly looking upset, even if they haven't said anything yet. Now, in some cases, like certain people I play with all the time, that's just the player acting because they act really well. In some cases, that might be the be because the player is actively upset and doesn't know how to express it. So checking in in a private DM with a particular player rather than necessarily the group message that's up for the Zoom chat. You as the host of the event are there to not just run the game, but to ensure that the people at the game have a good time. I'll reiterate that again. You, as the host of the game and the GM of the game, are there to facilitate people having a good time. They are taking this opportunity that they could have been you know, people take off their own stream schedule. They are not participating. They're doing this for the benefit of their own hearts. I will be straight up and entirely honest and entirely blunt. A bunch of people said yes, that they would do this for free because it was a charity event. And that's great. If you can play your player, pay your players, that's even better. But most of us are going to be like, okay, for a charity event, This is our charity donation. Um, but because of that, be aware of what your players, you know, make sure that they're comfortable, make sure that they're having a good time, you know, engage with them, 
try and make sure like every other time you are being a good GM and you are trying to play with every player at the table and you're not try and minimize uh, main character syndrome it's an important thing to do minimizing main character syndrome But this is part of your job during the actual game running of the game. Now, if you are also producing, that means you're paying attention to how is the stream running? How are my assets going? What is the overlay? Is the information on the overlay correct? You know, or, or is everybody's handle or name or whatever identifier you given excuse me, to the correct character uh, camera? You know, have you, are your technical assets mostly working? We had some problems because apparently um, I probably made a mistake in its setup and we've never figured out what I did wrong. Um, the map became a bit of a problem, which was very strange. And I will try and for my next game, do it better. But knowing how the maps work and how that functions um, and sharing that information with your players if it's necessary, go right ahead. Um, it was okay because we switched gears and I could describe things well enough and that's going to be a thing. Things will go wrong. Again, I reiterate, something will go wrong while you are running production, while you are running the game. The way to handle that, however, is to make sure that you don't stress about it. And keep the game rolling and having fun. Like, for example, at one point during the third, or the second, at the end of the second set, you know, during the second session, D&D Beyond just didn't work for a while there. Okay, well, a bunch of people didn't have their, you know, had their characters and couldn't roll in D&D Beyond and do all these things, so we started rolling manually. Go with it. You cannot control. You The, the best you can do is control what you can control. You can't control what platforms are going to do on the internet. You can't control if a roll 20 suddenly decides to die. You can't control if, you know, somebody down your street blows a transformer and therefore you lose power. You can't control that. You can control how you treat your players at the table how you engage with your players at the table and encourage them to participate or encourage them to engage with the game. Um, you can control making sure that people are safe at the table. And that means using safety tools, checking in, you know, and like what I did is between every session in that break, when I got up for water or to stretch, I also checked the uh, lines and veils sheet to make sure that it was updated, that perhaps somebody, you know, had a bad day and needed to add something or discovered something that they wanted to add to that list and that I was keeping it going in real time and keeping it live. You, you know, keeping that information up to date for me as a GM. You can control to an extent how you respond to bad actors in your Twitch chat. Um, it does help if your mods are also aware that you're going to do a large event like this and can be in the chat then and can start reacting at the same time as you are. Um, but if you are a one person show, like me, you also want to have the Twitch chat up. You also want to be able to visually check it occasionally to make sure if there's anything going wrong or if the mods aren't able to immediately respond that you can go in and respond to any issue. It is a lot of work. 
a charity stream like this, even a one-shot three-hour charity stream where you are both producer and GM, is a lot of work. It can be very fulfilling. It can be a lot of fun. You can have some great times and have some great memories. Like apparently it's, uh, apparently small folk, uh, and by that I mean dwarves and halflings, like to attack Dracula's crotch. What can I say? Probably the closest target. Um, but you can have those great memories that you're going to get out of this because it's going to be a thing. You can have all of these great moments and enjoyment and it, things that come out of it. But you need to remember that you're responsible for other people at the table and that is a lot of work. You need to be prepared to have that frank conversation about people having fun, knowing that sometimes you're going to invite some people and that they're going to be say no. You need to not turn around and go on Twitter and be like, I'm going to tag these five people because they're really famous on Twitter, whatever that means. And uh, because I think they'll give me lots of views and that'll help me build up my rep and that'll be really, really great. No, <laughs> don't treat people like that. Just don't. These are things that you as the both the GM and the producer can control. These are things that you should control and should know how to do. And when it comes to the game itself, right? Like the moment of gameplay and facilitating the gameplay, you want to allow pauses, even in a meat grinder, even in a charity one shot for people to enjoy RPing with each other, to make funny decisions, to yes and with each other all across the screen. And then bring in, you know, a swarm of flying Medusa heads. You want to bring in a, you know, you want to have your map generally set and kind of go from there and start attempting to murder your players. You know? And then allow every group, right? Like, that was the other thing. Pay attention to the clock. Pay attention to the timing. Make sure that everybody gets breaks and stretches and does well. Um, you, if you're doing a 12-hour stream, it will be a marathon for you in general. But if you're also running production and GMing and acting as the host for all of these players and paying attention to chat and making sure that not horrible things are happening in chat, it's going to be even more of a marathon, right? Like you're you're running the, mar that's a triathlon that you're juggling 15 things in the middle of. It is a lot. It is tiring. Make sure when you schedule this event that you have a day off the day after. I'm not saying you were going to, you know, be in bed all day or you're not going to be able to do anything. No, no, you need a day to rest. And, a, you know, it's like any time you do a heavy workout, you need a rest day occasionally. Rest days are important. Doing a 12 hour charity stream running 70, you know, for a TTRPG or even uh, means that you need rest afterwards. Even if you're running a single one shot three hour thing you're probably going to need rest afterwards. And that's okay. You should be able to take a break on occasion and recover from the amount of physical and mental energy that you're going to be putting into this particular 
event. It will be a lot. It will be a lot and that's okay. Now, when you finish playing the game and you are, as you're running the game and you're letting people highlight special abilities, um, showcase different skills, let them have their moments, let them meet, and, and let all of the teams meet a big bad um, it just so happened that Team 3, instead of meeting Dracula, because they found a secret room, ended up meeting one of the <laughs> turned members of Team 2. Have a big old, you know, have a boss fight moments. Boss fights are good. Let the people have funny moments. It'll be fun. But recognize that you as a GM are going to GM differently for an event like this um, than if you are going to GM for a normal event. When I normally GM, I really enjoy very complex themes, very complex plots, um, m twisting my tw player's backstory into the world and letting it affect the world, but also letting NPCs affect them, um, like I do. But it, I am much more aware of a clock on a charity stream like this. Um, you know, I, I pay attention. I know when we're getting close. I know when to bring the big boss in because that's what people want. They want to fight Dracula, um, whether they get to them or not. Malkadoshian says, sure, running a 12-hour meat grinder is difficult, but trying to just read a book and having your home and castle invaded at least four different times and interrupting you, that's madness. Well? Look, I didn't say you're Dracula. You're, you're gonna have issues. <laughs> we unflexed him. I see that, Hawkeye. Um, I told Arvandus, by the way, that you all, um, Went after the, the dwarf and uh, got uh, complicated. But you need to be able to be aware of, a little bit more aware of the clock. And while in general, a very railroady story is negative when a GM forces players not just into situations, but also into decisions that they may not have otherwise made. A one shot like this is not so much railroady as what I like to call a scrolling platform, <laughs> which is what this Castlevania is, right? It's a scrolling platformer. And there are going to be branching moments that the players are going to get to choose but I also know where on the platform, where on the screen you are and how far you are. And my thing as a GM is like, I need to give you opportunities within my time constraints to have fun, to show off and to meet the big bad and attempt to flirt with him. Or attempt to uh, use really badly played recorder music to uh, overcome <laughs> and persuade things. Um, 
Hawkeye says, it's a scripted story, but you know that going in, at least you should if it's presented as a meat grinder. Yeah, yes. I don't think of it so much as a scripted story, uh, uh, Hawkeye. I think of it as the story beats are scripted and what you do with it is going to be your own choice. Like, for example, Hawkeye's group, the third group, managed to theoretically all survive their boss fight encounter and therefore are probably still running around Castle Dracula trying to get the heck out. Uh, the first group, um, everybody who immediately died would, would, uh, so would be resurrected at the start section. <laughs> So, realistically speaking, the cleric and the paladin who both died, uh, Uhenio's character and pirate, uh, painting pirate's character, Chris's character, um, would have been resurrected by themselves at the start session to still run around. Um, Sam's character is probably still climbing on a wall somewhere. You know, like, you're going to have these moments and the moments are going to be scripted based on timing rather than ba and, and story beats rather than this is a script we all know going in that this is the points A and B and this is my response and da 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 I don't play that. But you will in a charity stream like this, whether it's 12 hours or three hours or anything in between. It's a one shot. You need to have your players buy into it. And it's a one shot. You need to the players need to be aware that you're going that there's going to be certain beat moments where because you want to facilitate greater engagement, both with the charity and with the players and all of these things, you're going to tweak things like there were whole bunches of other things that people could have found. Nobody found the killer fish people. I feel that that is unfair. Nobody nobody found the killer fish people. Um, there were two other boss fights you could have come across in that um, um, there were four other there were three uh, two other relics you could have found. Um You know. Have some good ones, uh, Mel. Enjoy yourself. We go fishing. We'll go fishing for next year's fundraiser. Um, I mean, I was thinking about doing one quarterly, and I have an idea for what the next one will be, but I, I then realized that that will be right in the middle of me finals for law school and possibly uh prep for the bar so that's not happening um it might change we'll find out might be. we'll find things out but again a a charity stream a one-shot stream you need to think of it like you are planning a party a dinner party a formal event and think about who you're inviting think about how you are inviting them um be, don't just pull a well you want to come over and hang out tonight no okay well what are you gonna do I don't know. no don't do that people's time is valuable and you need to respect that you need to be aware of what you're planning who you're planning to invite if you're running like now because this was a 12 hour charity stream and I didn't um, I was going to need at least 20 people, you know, I was, who I, I was asking at least 20 people and I knew I was needed at least 16 uh, to really do this well. I couldn't tell everybody in advance in the invitation who I was inviting. But when I invite people to an actual game, like a game at my table, whether that's a small group one shot or a short form run or even a long form run, I tell people who the other players I'm considering are, and that's important too, so that they can make informed decisions. But at its end and at its core, 
You need to treat an event like this, a huge event like this, as if it is a major party you're throwing. You need to think about your guest list. You need to think about your place cards. You need to think about your seating arrangement. You need to think about um, what promotional material you're putting together. You need to share that promotional material with other people so that they can share it around. You need to uh, uh, think about how you're going to facilitate both production and GMing. You know, or is that something you can do or do you need assistance with that? You know, and, and these are all things you need to think about before you decide to run a game like this. And then once you've reached that point where you have found the answers to those questions, you need to then begin approaching people to play in your game professionally and appropriately. And by that I mean, cons take a second to check their Twitter bio, see if they have a preferred way of communication, and take a second to see how they, you should address them. Maybe their pronouns are in their bio. Oh wait, even better. Maybe their name is in their email and you should spell it correctly. If you're copy and pasting from somebody's bio, you should be able to spell their name correctly. Just saying. But that's two hours of fun that we've just had in chatting. Uh, and that's generally it, right? Like that's not, it's not a lot. It's not difficult you need to just remember and think about it as if you are being respectful of people's time and place and having the appropriate information in the uh, uh invitation and then having enough communication with your players for them or prospective players for them to make informed decisions So the next question, so the, I think what we're going to do, if there are no further questions from chat about this concept and about this, I mean, that's all of my notes. That's everything I had to talk about. So the takeaways are make a decision about what you're going to do before you talk to anybody in the world. Do not randomly tag people on Twitter without an immediate, without an idea of what you actually want to ask them to be part of. Do communicate with people through their respected desired means of communication. Don't misspell their names in any invitation if you have it right there in front of you. Do include all of the important inv information for the player to make an informed choice about whether to participate in this event or not in the invitation. Do provide um, forms to allow people to pick the best timing that would work for them if it is a long... Hello, Ice Bunny. Well, happy New Year. Uh, do allow people to... Uh, if it is a 12-hour stream, do provide timing in the form to allow people to pick the best time that would work for them. If it is a one-shot, let people know the date, time, and... If available at, and you know who you're communicating with and what time zone they live in, add the time zone that the game will be played in, in this case, Eastern. And then I always say, for example, the 12 p.m. 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Uh, British time. Like, if I'm talking to somebody I don't know that lives in the UK, I try and make sure I inform them of the time zone. I don't always succeed, um, but I do try. But, you know, I, I try and try, and I don't always succeed. And I'm not perfect, I, I know that, but, I, but these are things that I consider the bare minimum. 
make sure that if you have the opportunity, you have a session zero. And even if you don't have the opportunity, you inform players of everything. You keep in consistent communication with them. You ask their opinions and ask them questions. You give them opportunities to engage with material. Time zones are a pain, but at least, you know, if I try and give you the opportunity and inform you of what I know about them, then makes it easier, right? And uh, take the time to share promotional assets with people. Uh, get before players, share the promotional assets with the players before you share them with the worldwide internet because it will um, let them have right of disapproval. Um, make sure that whatever be aware that something technologically will go wrong and do not sweat it make sure you are prepared to run the game that you've got your monster stats you've got your um npc stats you've got a general map if you're using one all set up and your musical cues all set up To make your life easier. And recognize and pay attention to the clock so you can build in breaks and build in, um, you know, make sure there's an opportunity for all of the players at the table to show off their various um, skills and features and traits and things that make their character cool. And the last and most important thing is have fun. Because if you as the GM and the producer are not having fun, that will A, be obvious to everyone and B, make how long and how much of a grind this whole process is 15 times harder. You will be tired at the end of a 12 hour stream. You'll be extremely tired if you are spending the time working on production and GMing and facilitating, um, you know, player safety and comfort and watching chat. You will be tired. But if you're not having fun, you will be 10 times more tired and you will just not want to do this ever again. So. If there are no more questions from chat, I think, I think that's a good place to end it for today. I mean, this is all I really had to say. So, we should see about sending a raid out, I guess, if there's anybody up. Oh, um, uh, Tanya's up. We should go raid Tanya, because this was her suggestion. <laughs> Playing some God of War, Ragnarok. We'll, we'll go raid Tanya. Um, and, uh, send some love her way and until next time everybody I'll, you know I might do a couple more of these chats I really enjoy them I think they're great um, we might do a couple more of these random chats I'll put them up on YouTube um, I'm also going to put up um, the link uh, the charity VODs the, the streams from Charity Vania VODs those are going to go up on YouTube 
Um, thank you for hanging out with me today. <sighs> glad you could enjoy this. Um, oh, I'm glad you found it uh, in, uh, useful, Rex. Um, like I said, I'll put the VOD up. It'll be lots of things. And I um, hope everybody has a good day. But as for me, you can find me on Twitter, at Deirdre Donlin on Twitter, or um, Praxworth has me a foria, easy to see me around here on Twitch. You can find me over on Hive, at Prax the Bard on um, Hive. Uh, you can um, check out the YouTube. There's a link for that in chat. You can also, um, I also have a Ko-Fi. You want to support the channel and help me out. It's a great way to do that. Um, we also have a, um, I also write games and put them up on itch. Done a lot of Descended from the Queens games. Um, I've also done some, um, putting a bunch of those up on Story Synth, which is a platform that allows you to play narrative card bait, narrative games like that online with your friends in a much easier manner than other tabletop role playing games. Um, so yeah. You can check me out there and uh, follow here. Um, we'll be, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, looking forward to seeing how things go in the new year. We'll be back. I'll, I'll probably do a couple little small streams in the next few days, but I'll definitely be back on um, the week of the fifth, uh, 16th for Montreal by night and the premiere uh, over on Wandering DM um, and season two of Wan Montreal by night over on Wandering DM's channel. Um, and we'll have the uh, season five premiere on January, Sunday, January 15th here on the channel, the, fin the final season. We're in the final countdown, uh, but we should go over and raid Tanya, send some love. If you're a subscriber, you can go ahead and use the sus subscriber emotes for just some the little puppy love. And uh, until next time, everybody. Bye.